to wrap this up. I, and that's a great segue to uh, <clears throat> start to wrap this up. I, I've got three rapid fire questions. Some of rapid fire. Kind of fun question. Well, I'm really bad about a rapid fire answer, but we'll do. I'll try to speed it up. Go ahead. Well, I just didn't have to be rapid. So, and I'm a deer hunter, and I know you are. And we both love the animal and hunting them, pursuing them, venison and everything. What is, and it doesn't have to be here in the low country, what is just your idea, one of the best habitats, one of the best environments? that you just absolutely love and look forward to deer hunting you know if you can pick a region an area mm -hmm. is it a hardwood swamp it, you know turkey hunters kind of have that but you know you as a deer hunter you've been all over the world hunting but what, what what's just you just what's an area you just love spending time with a firearm mm -hmm. hunting i love a property with a swamp and as I said earlier, uh, with this quality deer management approach, we pass bucks up till they're three and a half. From that point on, they pass us up. And you give a whitetail a swamp, and Mother Nature is working hand over fist with you to create a natural sanctuary. And those deer know how to use those swamps. They'll bed down on a little tussock in that swamp. They'll, they may wade a hundred yards out. They might get belly deep in the water to find a little tussock that you can just about reach around it. As long as it's high and dry, they can curl up. And they've got it made. Nothing's gonna sneak up on them. It's gonna have to splash to get to them and be detected. And uh, there's a lot more of that going on now. And, and I think the coyote has had a lot to do with that too. I've got a friend that hunts in North Carolina and he wears waders mm -hmm. to, to get to where he hunts deep in the swamp. And he said, look, mid morning, I couldn't tell you some mornings how alive that swamp is with deer activity. I, I, I like to describe it, <coughs> you know, it's almost like a natural security system. You know, in any, you know, they, they're going to hear every little thing that comes through. Yeah, you, trail cameras. You you look at, at trail camera shots of deer in the low country, yes, sir. and at night, if they look like they got on black cowboy boots, they came out of the swamp. <laughs> That's how they got black to here. Uh, they they're driven to those refugia. Uh, it's the safest ha haven there is. For that so yeah and, and that's I, where correct me if i'm wrong I, I i don't know a lot about the restocking phase but weren't a lot of deer pulled from from swamps and wetlands when they were you know restocking deer uh, here in south carolina well we're the only state that did all of its stocking from within its own boundaries we're, and, and that, that's that that should <laughs> that says a lot yeah, and and with with traditional deer hunting, years and years and years of really hitting those bucks, the only places where deer numbers were still pretty high was in these natural refuges. That's right. These, these sanctuaries. So yeah, and the, and the upland properties adjacent to those, and that that was where a lot of the stocking took place, from the Francis Marion down to. Uh, the lower part of the state. That's right, and that, that uh, is, is a, we have a big wetland system. Yeah. Swamps. Yeah. And that leads me to the next question, second question. Let's say you've been on the road, you haven't been home for a week or so. You've been eating on the road, and you're home, and your freezer's full of game. <laughs> All the game you hunt, you pursue fish, turkey, everything. And it's the weekend, and you're and you're and you're looking forward to cooking. What are you cooking? You've got you've got all the time to prepare the dish. But what what's just a go-to? It doesn't have to be elaborate, hmm. but it, it doesn't have to be venison. Mm -hmm. What's just a go-to dish that you, you just? It usually it usually is venison, and and as long as I'm physically able, I'll keep doing my own processing, and I try to put twelve in the freezer every year. 
for the family and friends. I hardly ever kill half that many, but I hunt with the right people, especially late in the season when their freezers are full and we still have a need to harvest does and they'll shoot one. What am I going to do with it now? They'll my tailgate's down. <laughs> so, no, I don't kill 12 does a year, but I, I, I have been, knock on wood, lucky enough to put that many in the freezer every year. I kept records a couple of years ago and I missed four days of having venison for a meal, uh, a day. Uh, so 350 some days that year I had venison. My favorite? Uh, That's amazing by the way. I just wanted to, I, I'm not in rut, but I have thought about that for a couple of years. I really wanted to track how many meals. I was just curious. Yeah. How many meals I was actually eating venison yeah. or wild game. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, look, if just as a, a sideway segue into nowhere, there's a story in my book entitled Lead in Venison. Mm -hmm. And I was driven to this a few years ago. There was a doctor who had taken the Hippocratic Oath to look out for people whether they could pay him or not. You know how that goes? Right. He was also on the board of directors of an anti-hunting group. I will not mention that group, but he took it upon himself to take a random sample of donated venison. So he went around to soup kitchens or whatever and he got these frozen packages, took them back to his office, x-rayed them, and showed a tremendous scattering of lead. I don't think that was a representative sample. I, I think yeah. it was yeah. doctored to show what he wanted to show. And he got the soup kitchens and the venison donation program shut down in three states. How many tens of thousands of pounds of venison was taken to landfills that year because of him? Oh, man. Well, roughly what year was that? Just, it, just out of, uh, I mean, like, time in the 90s. It was not that long ago. That, that takes a special person to... He, he, put, he put his so-called love of animals mm -hmm. over his professional dedication to the health of humans. I mean, by signing the Hippocratic Oath. And, and proved to me he was living the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, so I, and, and the whole reason was that lead and venison was, was causing all these problems, especially with kids. So they got over 700 volunteers to, to have blood drawn, check their levels for lead, and, and a big questionnaire to go with it, very exhaustive. What kind of a house do you live in? Uh, it has been, has, how old is your house? Was it painted with lead paint? Uh, and what is your avocation? Do you deal with lead in your avocation? On and on and on. And the, the, the lead levels of those volunteers were the same as a sample size from across the nation. They weren't elevated, and they were known venison eaters and game eaters. So I started that January. I had my blood te tested for the lead level. I ate venison that year. Um, I probably missed about 10 days that year, 10 or 12 days. But some days I had it twice. Some days I had it three times. I like that. And then I tried to figure out the average consumption per meal and then come up with how many pounds I had eaten in a year's time. And then at the end of that, I had my blood tested and the blood lead level didn't change at all. But look, I processed my own deer. That's right. And I am going to be very careful cutting around that bullet channel. Uh, I'm not sure that some deer processors are that careful, but still I question the validity of that sample size that the doctor did. Uh, Anyway, so that's how that came about. I like that. I, I like your scientific approach to, <laughs> you know, your venison consumption and then testing your, your lead levels. Yeah. Um, that, that, you know, science is, you know, science is what, in my opinion, that, that, that's the main driving factor in, in you know, yeah. I was, my life. 
I was told by uh, mentors early on that the way to get through this problem with deer management and, and many other problems in life is persistence and patience. And when something like this came along, like lead and the venison, I thought, well, it's gonna take me a year. So I gotta be really patient, but I gotta be persistent. I've gotta do my homework. I've gotta eat venison, maybe when I don't even want to. That's rare. Uh, but came up with the right results. And, right. and like you said, you, so if you've got a platform or if you've got an opinion, you need some solid ground to stand on. And that comes with research. And that's another thing that this deer organization has been really active in. We have, have supported research at the university level throughout the nation. That's right. And uh, as I, I mentioned a while ago that I had gone down to Tasmania back in 88, I think was my first trip. Well, just in a few weeks, we have an entourage going there from here. And it's Dr. Craig Harper from the University of Tennessee, Dr. Bronson Strickland from Mississippi State, Mississippi State, and our own Kip Adams, our Director of Conservation. They're going down yes, sir. to give talks on habitat management and deer management. And to have been a part of blazing that trail, I can't tell you how rewarding that is. I mean, it just it just over the top. And I told you and, I only had one more question left, but yeah. this, I've got two now. How, I mean, right now in your career, right now in your lifetime, you, 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 we've covered a lot in you sharing that. You know, three or four uh, research biologists, people in the field, in the trenches, going down there, and that's something you started. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, that's got to be something special to, you know, have started something, a movement, and here we are in 2023, and there's a group of highly renowned, respected gentlemen in their own field mm -hmm. coming down there to talk after all these years. Yeah. It's amazing. I didn't do it alone, Mark. I had people on either flank and behind me, and it was, it was sort of like my introduction to Al Brothers and his commitment. When you drive a truck from Laredo to Charleston with hand controls, I'm gonna get behind you. So I learned then that I had to go into this new paradigm of deer management with that same level of commitment and dedication. And that's infectious. It's, it's difficult to do that without having people beside you and behind you. And yeah, I mean, it wasn't just my idea. I, I was at the right place at the right time. I saw the need for it. I was, and I had constituents, my hunters here that I was being paid to serve with a need. And I saw a way to provide that. And there was no stopping, again, patience and practice and persistence had a lot to do with that but you, you can't make those changes overnight and and you'll get a bloody nose and some skin knees along the way but that's almost any venture is like that you know if you if you go into something with no obstacles number one if you get to to the end to your goal you're not going to fully appreciate it right. you will not have put much skin in the game uh, with this, we had a lot of skin in the game. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, he did. So, yeah. I, I'd, I'd like to end it with one last question, Joe. I, um, and you don't necessarily have to single out, you know, necessarily one time or event, but what, what, what was something you can look back on as a conservationist? Hmm. Is, is, what, what, what's something that was one of your proudest moments as conservation. You've worn a lot of hats, and, and, mm. and we've discussed that today. Um, but, you know, looking back, I, I think, you know, it, 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 at your heart, you're a conservationist. You love the land. You've talked about it. Mm -hmm. what, what's just what's a proud moment for you? I, um, I, I was asked by a young fellow who was working on his 
uh, requirements for Eagle Scout badge. And and one of his assignments was to talk to a, an older Eagle Scout and, and ask them how they got there. You know, what set of values did they have? And <clears throat> I said, look, I, I learned early on that, that the harder you work to repay someone, whether it's your parents or, or mentors that you had when you were in Sunday school or Boy Scouts or a hunting club, and then later for me was in college, Dr. Larry Marshington. He really stuck his neck out for me, uh, or extended his wing and said, look, I'll, uh, I'll serve as your major professor, but you've really got to produce. And my message to this young prospective Eagle Scout was, the harder you work to repay somebody that you learned from, the more successful you're going to be. And that's, that's my answer right there. And, and every time something good has happened, it, I mean, when we got the word in, in 1999 that we, we, deer hunters across the nation, kill more antlerless deer than antlered, who do you think I called? Dr. Marshington, and then our brothers. And, and to be able to have that kind of rapport with my, with my mentors was something. But the thing that really happened was when, in, in 2011, when the Quality Deer Management Association was given that award by my professional society. Yes, sir. Uh, when, when those people realized what we had accomplished and the potential we had to continue making progress, that was the arrival time. We have gotten there. We've been, we've been working and working and working and, and this was a benchmark in our life as an organization and as as people behind the organization. So yeah, that was the highlight of my time. And and now to hear recently that the Pope and Young Club is recognizing us, I mean, it's it's uh, that words can't describe the feeling of pride. Just look around, and uh, I've I've talked in front of a lot of groups, and I talk about my wealth. And if they know that I've been in the wildlife profession my whole career, they know I'm not financially wealthy. And I am wealthy in friendships. And no animal could have brought that many together than the whitetail, yes, better than the whitetail. I mean, lasting relationships as strong as any blood bond there is in families. So I am a wealthy person, and uh, yes, sir. I, I don't take that lightly. You have mentioned that to me before about how amazing it is, white, how the white-tailed deer brings people together. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to thank you for your time. Myself, I, I, I was a student of QDM. Um, it, you know, it, my journey kind of took a while, but being in a, a hunting club, that practice QDM from the very well from the beginning of the hunting club, early '90s, and growing up in that, and you know, looking up to QDM Act, mm -hmm. looking up to you, mm -hmm. looking up to other people that were in that field, and being able to, um, you know, connect with you, right? Friend, you was really, you know, um, it. it uh, I, I will say it definitely. Uh, I, it definitely, I, I had a fire that was already there, conservation, mm -hmm. but you, you, inspiration is all I can mm -hmm. say. Inspiration to, um, to, you know, talk about this, share your sure. story. And, that, and yeah. that's something that I, um, I can say how, how you have changed, changed me. So, yeah. Um, well, you, you proved that when I made my first visit to your property a number of years ago. Yes, sir. And, and got to meet you and your dad and, and other family members and, and close hunting friends. And I was there not to hunt, but just to observe. I was so impressed with the respect you showed your deer. I mean, we had a sabuco for one of the main meals. 
been one of my favorite uh, recipes ever since. The fact that you keep all your deer skins and, and donate them, uh, the, at every venture you were showing the deer the ultimate respect. And I had no problems nominating you and your dad for as a team for the Owl Brothers Non-Professional Deer Managers of the Year. And you deserved it. And, and you've worked hard every year since to, to, to show that you continue to deserve that. And now you're gonna be hosting the Deer Steward 2 course in August. Um, that that's, it takes a brave person to have people from out of state come here in August. Yes, yes it does. Uh, they'll learn how to swat and learn how to sweat because yeah. there'll be no shortage of sand gnats and mosquitoes and the heat and humidity together are killers but but you know what that's that's what the deer are in i mean the the, the deer live in that you they know, do that's, that's right sometimes you gotta, yeah you gotta get out in their world well mr mr joe thank you for your time i really appreciate it. thanks that. for your dedication i really appreciate it i realized a while back that it was time to pass the the torch to the younger generation and i can't thank you enough for being a good representative of that next generation uh, your heart's in the right place your talents are are there to make sure the message gets across i like what you're doing with your children i've got grandchildren i'm trying to do the same thing with and it's uh, it's a good family that we're a part of and it's a good cause that we're behind Let's stay together and stay behind it. Absolutely. So thank you for what you're doing. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.